nice full side glass. Got a brand new fan motor and fan blade. We're gonna get it recovered and chop that uh, headmaster out. I'm gonna look at those prices. I'm gonna go ahead and write them down now. We have got something to look at when I get done. Eight. Go ahead and get this thing recovered. Just gonna reuse the refrigerant in a sense of waste. And got a new tank here. Last trip, I was curious about our time, so we're 907-ish area, and so that seems to be working okay. That's one way to do it. Just chop it off and do it right at the connector there. Gonna go ahead and clean this thing up. I'm gonna unbraze what I can unbraze, like this one right here. Should just have to do that one right there. So we'll go ahead and unbraze this one, we'll unbraze that one, pull it out, and then we'll just make a nipple for that one right there. Hey, there's a little bitty uh, strainer right there. I got a uh, nitrogen purge going through it right now also. said right here's a little strainer oh my jeez oh criminy holy crap look at that look at that crap that oh my gosh that is freaking ridiculous that black stuff is all over it that my friends is what happens when you do not use nitrogen Poor valve. Like you see that crap flaking off? You can't even see through that thing. This thing has been brazed on so many times with no nitrogen. It's just packed full of crap. Goes to show you, nitrogen's kind of important. I don't like doing it either, but it's paying the butt. But if you want the job done right, it's what you gotta do. I'm telling you though, what makes the job so much easier is if you got one of these regulators, just set it for purge and she does her thing. I wouldn't say it's necessarily a defective valve, but here's the thing. Even though that was plugged up, I'm not taking a chance putting it back in there. So could we have taken it apart and possibly cleaned it? Yeah, but not all of them necessarily have that screen. And then you've taken the whole refrigerant charge out, putting it back in, a lot of time wasted. So I, I still stand by changing the valve and being done with it. I'm gonna purge through here and see if uh, I'm getting more crap out of it. Let it build up some pressure. Look at that, crap came out of the receiver even. The new one did not come with a strainer, unfortunately. You got your receiver, your condenser, and your discharge, D, C, and R. If you use the blow through the condenser right now, nothing will come out, but you can go right through your receiver or your discharge, and it'll just go on through. So naturally, when this thing has no pressure on it, it's holding back the condenser and lets a certain amount go through. You can actually hear it. So it lets quite a bit of uh, gas through there. LAC4215. Made in the United States. I love it when things are made here. Be nice more masks were made here, huh? So receiver, just here. So it's gonna point down. Discharge is right there. And there's the other. So we can fit that right on there like that. This we can bring back in here like this. And then this piece right here, we'll just make a stub real quick. I keep all my copper on one of those little husky strap things. So I got half inch, quarter inch, and three eighths. So to make it simple, I just brought the whole roll up. I didn't feel like chopping a big chunk off. But three eighths, this little drill can run it. Look at that, nice and simple. I love that swedge tool from Hillmore, but my God, I'm not paying 380 bucks for this stupid thing. So four fingers, that's my measuring system. Well, about three fingers. So we're right there at three fingers. There you be, deburr that real quick. The burrs ain't bad, you can kinda do that. Yeah, it smooths out the edges. And they're like that. Eh. Lift that up there like that, eh. shove her together be able to run nitrogen through these fittings right here no problem this one here is going to be the one you really aren't going to be able to so you just got to do your best with it i'm going to go ahead and get this one done first i like my hot block but that stuff's kind of messy sometimes 
warm this thing up a little bit, make sure we slide her in all the way. There we go, like that. And then Bring it into the joint. Bottom. There we go. Let that cool for a moment. I like my braze joints to look like a solder joint when you're done. Just slowly cool it down. I don't want to like rapidly cool it because you will weaken your joint and you're hardening the metal, but same time, you got to balance it. 250 degrees is the max they want. Sometimes strips of uh, of uh, paper towel sometimes works pretty nice too, which is always kind of surprising if you think about it. I would have never thought of that. I made fun of the guy that was doing it and uh, I started trying it and actually it's not too bad. But I do one thing I don't like is you get that thing too close to this joint and you take forever to heat that thing up. And then you're on it forever, which then ends up transferring the heat through to the valve. And that, that's not a good thing. Take our primary crease first. Okay, battery went dead. So we went ahead and stopped at that one there and Gonna go ahead and reposition my rag again, but I'm just gonna make sure everything stays cool. I like I said, uh, I like to do one piece at a time. I'm not gonna say I'm the brazing authority, but I do feel as though I do a good job. Some people might think my frame's too big, but even in the book there from uh, Sporland says, "Get on, get off. Don't be on there with a tiny, teeny little flame." Reminds me back in school days. They're like, "Yeah, you need a little pencil tip, you know, like your TIG welding or something." and uh, you're on that thing forever next thing you know you blow a hole through it i like more of a softer flame technically oxidizing you're supposed to have neutral flame but like i said i'm not the authority on it but i know what works and uh don't look too bad for an amateur go ahead and get that last one down there like i said nitrogen's flowing right on through it's coming right out over here you just barely feel it coming out through the receiver there hunka towel here it's freaking in the way this is where it's just too thick total pain in the hind end total pain in the hind end i'll tell you what we're gonna go ahead and use hot block i just don't like the way this stuff breaks apart i don't know if i'm not doing something right or what it really reminds me of the paper towels that uh shop towels that'd be kind of funny if this stuff ain't nothing more than some shop towels that's been grinded up and then added some flame retardancy to it if we get on and get off pretty quick we should be all right some people probably think this is so over engineered here and they're making too big of a deal about it. A little bit of time you spend here could prevent uh, you having a callback later. Put that capillary action, pull it up in there. Trying to put most of my heat on the actual valve there to make sure it all pulls up in there. There we go. Yeah, I can hold my hand there. Kinda. So. I like just cool it down down here at the bottom. I'm not on the joint itself. I know, this ain't what you're supposed to do. All my crevices look to be full. No melting on the sticker. So we know that we didn't overheat the valve by the sticker. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you torched it or destroyed it internally, but you definitely can tell. And while that's pulling a vacuum, pop this apart and take a look inside. You can see that that's really dark. Nothing in there, but you can see the blackness on the inside of that. There's your seal, cap, ring, piston seal. That's what floats back and forth. You can see that crap. And then you've got an actual So that actually is pretty free. Yeah, it probably could have been cleaned up. 
but like I said, you waste too much time. You know, you probably could have taken it apart, popped the head off, cleaned some of this crap out, but the amount of time to pull the vac on it and then start all over again if it didn't work, you may have just uh, cost them two hours, you know, and then, you know, that's more than the cost of the valve. Just cut that off. There's another one of them little bad boys in there. So we had one coming through the discharge and the receiver both. So they had a strainer basically on both of them, but unfortunately they didn't send me new strainers and I'm not gonna reuse these dirty things. All right, for giggles, I'm gonna go ahead and do it off the suction side of the tank and just flip it upside down. I've already bled my hose there. Like I said, I'm gonna go ahead and just add a base charge here. We're gonna get a full sight glass and then we're gonna kinda see what it takes to fill it up solid and then, uh, then add the extra for it calculated in this is a pretty short line set we're basically going right from here over to the edge and right down over the edge of the roof so we're not talking a, a whole bunch and it should kick on at 20 something both fans are running which is good so at five pounds we're, we're basically completely empty so five pounds is not enough Superheat says it's 80 degrees. So we are either poorly adjusted, which DXV looked like it had been changed once before, or it's restricted. But my head pressure is not very high. So I'm gonna say we're gonna go down there and open it up a touch and see what we get. All right, I can hear it. Does not feel it does not sound like it's feeding properly at all. Um, it actually has. So it got one. I can't hardly tell from here. Actually has a strainer there. I'm gonna pump this thing down and check that strainer real quick. Go ahead and pump it down with the receiver. My screen is clear. Good on that. TXV is 404, so we have the right TXV in here, at least we hope. I went ahead and ignored it, but I shouldn't have. We're cold coming out of the condenser. It's 100% bypassing and going straight into the uh, receiver. Receiver's hot, very hot. All right, checking our liquid temperature coming out of the valve there. We're at 100 degrees. That's generally what we're shooting for. Superheat's 41, box is doggone close to him. I'm going to parallel that on there and go down there and see if we can get this superheat set up. It's uh, been a pain in my butt. I've never seen one hold this much. Very unusual. I think we're right now at about 12 pounds and a half. I mean, granted, just a weird small one. I would have never thought it would have held this much. Here's we're connected. I got the superheat to 21. Box right now, 13 degrees. So we're getting close. This is right after the TXV, five degrees, 12 degrees after it. So we're checking the temperature after the TXV versus the outgoing side. This is a little trick learned off old Jim Panetto. This tends to be quicker than the traditional superheat method, or at least gets me they're closer. So right now, 12 minus five should be about seven. That's about the ballpark we need. So you got a seven degree uh, delta T across your evaporator going in, going out on the refrigeration side. Suction's a lot better. Didn't hook up my high side. Superheat's 21. I'm gonna say we're gonna get closer to that once we get closer to box. Like I said, box in here is a 12. You really want to adjust it when you're about to zero. So we'll tweak it a little bit as we get closer. So Arch News, that's the one I really like. Those guys seem to really have the best, best articles out there that I've seen. So you've got mostly liquid, some liquid vapor flashing. That's where I was checking at. And here you should have 100% vapor. So. This little deal here, I mean, it's literally in the bone uh, startup manuals um, for 
instances like this where somebody didn't put a pressure cap for the suction line. Should have left it where it was at. Your compressor superheat overrides the evaporator superheat. So take it back. It may respond back here in a second. These doggone TXVs, they take forever to respond. And there's my tester pro I'm using for my box. Like I said, it just uh, field piece probes don't do real good in super extreme cold or extreme heat. All right, our super heat out here keeps swinging a little bit too. But seem to be fairly decent there. I went ahead and added the additional 1.3 pounds. Kind of have to be careful since it's cold outside. I don't want to calculate it as if it's a nice warm day. So this thing holds. 13 and a half pounds. Okay, I just fouled it off the receiver. Watching her pressures here. Let's see if she can handle it. Pressure's going back down. And she shuts off. Oh, and you figure too, Headmaster probably is doing a little trickery there. So we'll go ahead and check and see what our level is in this puppy. Probably should have done this earlier. So I heated this up a little bit and all of a sudden, right, boom, I start feeling the temperature. So we're somewhere in this ballpark right here. That's about 80%. So yeah, so we're well over half. I'm gonna say we are good to go. It's time to wrap this one up. Basically, Get that head pressure up there, block off the coil, whatever you gotta do, so you're leading, uh, feeding liquid uh, all the way through there. Once you get her happy, pump her down, make sure she holds. Um, this one here has a solenoid valve down below, so uh, it's got extra room for the uh, refrigerant, thanks to the uh, 3 8 line. All right, I wanted to go into a couple things that I mentioned in the video, because I'm sure I might have some questions on it or someone may be disagreeing with me. So here's Heatcraft's uh, refrigeration uh, startup installation manual. Uh, the unit I was working on was not a Heatcraft, but pretty much they all are going to follow about the same principles and guidelines, because they're all going to have either Copeland or Tecumseh or something like that. So one of the things I wanted to go over first was the alternative superheat method. And the time that you'd use this would be when you basically are missing your suction port and you don't have any way to put your gauge there at it, uh, at the where the sensing bulb is to calculate it out. So going down here to an alternative superheat method. Now, like I said, this is right here in the book from Heatcraft. This was part number 25001201. Granted, it was back in 2007, but this has not changed even as of today. So, alternative superheat method. The most accurate method of measuring superheat is found by following the previous procedure, which is your traditional suction line temperature minus your suction line saturation temperature. However, that method may not always be practical. An alternative method which will yield fairly accurate results is the temperature temperature method. Measure the temperature of the suction line at the point the bulb is clamped, outlet. Measure the temperature of one of the distributor tubes close to the evaporator coil inlet. Subtract the inlet temperature from the outlet temperature. The difference is superheat. So this uh, method will provide fairly accurate results. So I wanted to point that out because I know when I watched some of Jim's videos, people ripped him a new uh, butt one side down the other and basically made it sound like he was an idiot. But he even said in there that uh, one of the manufacturers back in the day said that it was okay. I've tried this method and generally it will be almost identical to the regular superheat method that we use. Um, this time here, it wasn't. One of the reasons why I kind of liked it was because it seems to react a lot quicker than the TXV does. TXV is going to swing up and down, and it just seems like it gets you there quicker. And then once the TXV is done playing its games of going up and down, it usually ends up working out okay. And then kind of going back to here, this is a review for most everyone out there that's been uh, in the field for 120 years. But the minimum compressor superheat is 20 degrees. And to kind of further that one there, Copeland mandates a minimum of 20 degrees at the compressor, and they recommend between 20 and 30 degrees. If adjustments to the suction superheat need to be made, the expansion valve at the evaporator should be adjusted. So they were basically just pointing out that you need to uh, worry about your superheat at your compressor, giving yourself some leeway for when it's moderate temperatures outside so that you don't have slugging of the compressor, washing out your oil from the compressor. And your recommended superheat here uh, with a 10 degree delta T 
Uh, they want somewhere between 6 and 10. If you have a 15 degree uh, delta T type uh, coil, uh, you could go 12 degrees to 15 degrees superheat. So just wanted to point a couple of those things out there. Uh, as far as the charging too for the uh, condenser, um, they uh, basically wanted you to have a liquid line temperature of 105 degrees. If not, they want you to block off the uh, coil. These are all things that basically I forgot to say something about. You gotta remember guys, like right now I'm at home. Now I have time to do it. I don't have any type of script worked out. We're doing these calls basically as they come in and I'm just talking as I'm working and sometimes my mind is not focused on what I'm saying. So that's a lot of times the reason why there's some pauses and things like that in between it. And uh, yes, I do talk quickly and that's just how I am all the time depending on what I'm going into. But uh, you know, you'd be surprised. The information they give you in this uh, startup manual here has got everything from how to lay out your uh, location of your evaporator. Basically, um, you know, they've got your obvious things in here as far as watching out for when you got a coupling there, when you got your bulb getting mounted there, where they want the bulb set at. I mean, this stuff is review, but, but hey, new guys, you're the reason why I'm doing these videos. Um, plus, you know, for me, going back through and relearning things is never a bad idea. A lot of information is in here, and you'd be surprised a lot of times you don't read them. I don't read them either. So I was really surprised when you go through here and you kind of get looking at it. Things like your low pressure cut in here. You know, for my area, we're somewhere around the negative 10 to no more than negative 20. Your cut in for 404 is right around 20. I usually do about 23 to 20 area so i mean they've got that information in here here's your different head pressure controls dual valve single valve and ambient fan cycle as far as checking your uh, pressures on the discharge side instead of actually checking it where i was checking it at which was on the receiver um, but my other valve port was taken by the dual pressure control that i had there the recommendations far as your fan cycle they want to keep a uh 90 degrees so when your fan gets down to about 90 degrees saturation temperature that's when you want it to shut off anyhow guys i just wanted to point those things out real quickly so that i could kind of just back up what i was trying to tell you guys and other than that until next time guys we'll catch you on the next one